Hello, I'm Craig Thielen, and this is the 1% Better Podcast. Today, I'm honored to speak with David Marquet, a retired United States Navy captain. In 1999, David was unexpectedly assigned to command the USS Santa Fe, a nuclear-powered attack submarine that was struggling with low performance and morale. By implementing his leadership approach and techniques, it empowered his crew to take control, make decisions, and it transformed the Santa Fe from one of the worst performing submarines in the fleet to one of the best. Um, after retiring in 2009, David became a sought after leadership consultant and speaker, and he is the best selling author of Turn the Ship Around and the Leadership is Language uh, books. So, David, welcome to 1% Better. Thanks, Craig, for having me on your show. Welcome, all listeners. Yes. Uh, so, well, you know, your story is kind of the the focus here. And it's, it's the focus of your book, and it's a fascinating story. I've got lots of questions for you. It's been a very influential story and legendary in some sort of circles that, that we work in, helping organizations drive culture change and using techniques like agility. It's it's just been a really great story. So let's just start with that. You tell it in your words. How did you, what led up to it? And and how did it unfold? I was this uh, kind of geeky, introverted kid who, in high school, I, I did things like computer club. Of course, the computer was as big as a refrigerator at that time. Uh, math team, chess club, that kind of stuff. And uh, okay. But I grew up in the 70s, and it was a tough time for the United States, and I wanted to do my part. I was supposed to be a scientist like my dad. But I went home and told my mom, hey, I want to join the submarines. I want to go join the military and particular submarines because why? Submarines hide from people. I mean, that's what they do. And that, you know, at the time, the sub, it was just the coolest thing. Submariners were the ones who were really kind of taking it to the Soviet Union and the ones who were mixing it up up close. And I, I want and I'd read what the submarine force had done during World War II, which was, of course, amazing and historic. Not to so, mention, we had the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, which was in there, and there were submarines floating all over, right? Yeah, could have been, possibly, who knows. <laughs> anyway, um, we're a secretive lot, as you know. So I went to the, I got appointed to the Naval Academy, and I showed up there, and they tell me, they hand me this book, and it says, leadership can be defined as directing the thoughts, plans, and actions of others. This is an exact quote. Okay. directing the thoughts, plans, and actions of others. And the dirty secret is I like that. That appealed to me because I viewed myself as one of the people directing the thoughts, plans, and actions of, of others because I was at the I was going to be an officer. Of course it meant that when I, you know, I was going, my bosses were going to attempt to direct my thoughts, plans, and of actions. Of course. And I found that somewhat frustrating and stultifying. Uh, but, you know, you play the game for the organization that you're in, and I would go back to really controlling my team. Leadership in this domain requires two things. One, generally being right, and two, getting your team to do what you want them to do. Now, is it's fundamentally coercion because the people who are choosing what to do are not the people who are doing what to do. And so A has to control B. And we don't use the word coerce because we don't want to be truly honest about it. So we'll say, well, we inspire them or we make a thing because their idea. But the bottom line is we're not letting we, if we're in the leadership cast, are not letting them in the doing cast choose what to do. We, we pat ourselves on the back and we say, oh, well, I'll decide what to do. And, and you small thinking people are going to get the opportunity to decide how to do it. And look, how enlightened am I as a leader? Well, I was really good at this. I was comfortable doing it. Uh, my teams, I, I just so happened that I kept going to kind of broken teams and making them better. When I left, the teams went back to where they were. It was simply more proof of what a great leader I was. And the Navy selected me and said, hey, you're going to be a submarine commander. You're so good at telling people what to do. So I studied for 12 months to go to one submarine. At the very last minute, they sent me to a different submarine day. Because that submarine, the USS Santa Fe, had two problems, poor morale, poor performance, and the captain quit a year early. Okay. So now they have a submarine, no captain. I had just finished school. 
They sent me this. So I said, you got two weeks. You're going to go to Santa Fe. The problem was Santa Fe was a different ship, different kind of ship, different class of submarine, a different reactor, different missile tubes or had missile tubes, which I never had, never studied for. Uh, it was one of the newest ships. And when I show up, I start giving orders and I make mistake. And a very fundamental order uh, is the very first exercise. We I had two weeks to take over. We go to sea, submerge the ship, reactor scram. Now, remember, I'm there to fix these guys. I'm there to implement this. Like, I'm going to tell you what to do, and you're going to gradually get better, and then maybe perhaps morale will improve. That's that's the sequence. Improve performance. A, improve performance. B, morale's going to improve. That's the thesis. Right. And so I made this. It, it was a meaning. It was a trivial mistake because nothing happened. I basically uh, suggested to the officer we go to second gear on the ele- on the electric backup motor, which there is none on this class of submarine. It's just a one speed motor, so nothing really happened. But the fact that he ordered it based on my suggestion, and then when I asked him afterwards, "Hey, did you know the?" He said, "Yes, sir, I did." It it rocked me back on my heels because all my strategies for leadership were about one of those two things, either making good decisions or getting the team to do it. And and what happens is when you tell someone what to do, in my mind, the way I picture it now is I'm giving them a piece of paper, a chit, that says, don't bother thinking. I'll right. do the thinking for you. Right. And and it's this it's it's this exemption from thinking that wipes out most organizations. So because we don't think we're not involved because we're not involved in the decision making process we don't need to think and we also don't have any ownership and we can always claim later well i knew it was a stupid idea but i was told to do it and so when you look at boeing uh, launching 737 max when you look at volkswagen and the diesel gate when you look at wells fargo uh, getting fined several hundred million for making fake accounts and then getting fined again two billion because they didn't really solve the problem the first time around. Over and over and over again, it's the same pattern. Pattern number one is we have these leaders who think they can achieve great things simply by uh, prognosticating on them. Oh, we're going to be the number one automaker in the world. When the like the laws of physics really and nature really are in charge, <laughs> but they think that their their blabber is in charge, which is not, of course. And then number two is it's a highly controlled environment. So all these companies, it was very command and control. The leaders all had big egos and big tempers and wanted to be followed. That what they wanted was compliance, and we didn't get thinking throughout the whole organization. So what I had to do was stop giving orders. And so it's really hard to find a movie or a book where the top person doesn't give orders. I don't care if it's a gang leader, is the military leader, the captain of the unit, it's the CEO, of the company. it doesn't matter. To make a good movie, we have to have a focus of attention and it tends to be the leader who's mm-hmm. out there making these decisions. Typically right. it starts with a bad decision or right. something we've inherited we have to fix, even though we've, we made it bad ourselves, but then we pat ourselves on the back for fixing problems we ourselves created. And anyway, so that's the typical thing. So it's very hard to imagine I gave no orders. Now, the way you do this is through language. So I would tell my team, hey, you guys come to me and tell me what you intend to do. Don't ask permission. So, David, can I just ask you one question? Because I want to, this is a big moment where you you got sort of rushed into a very significant, complex leadership role you weren't prepared for, but yet you jump in and say, well, I've been trained. I'll do my best. In the early days, you make a, a small mistake, and then you have this sort of epiphany. But what was it that told you, hey, I'm going to throw out all of the protocols of military, all the training, all the culture, all of the stuff that you know, you've know you been taught and you're part of the system and say, you know what, right now this is not going to work, and I'm going to go to plan B. And how did you yeah. know what plan B was, and how did you have the wherewithal to – that's a big – or was it – in micro decisions. I mean, how did that evolve at that moment? Yeah, I think it was a pretty big decision, but it was sort of always bubbling underneath the surface. There there were two things. One is I only cared about being a submarine commander. I didn't care about running the Navy. I mean, that would have been great, sure, if someone handed that to me. But I was never 
bucking for that job. I, I just wanted to be the best submarine commander I could ever be. And number two is I all I, I had a snippet. I had a, one captain way early in my career who played this I and 10 game with me. It, it wasn't so baked in throughout the whole ship, but at least with some of the officers, I saw it. And when and I felt when when he said, well, just tell me what you intend to do and, and back it up with your rationale. I felt I felt empowered. I, and and we got more done on my watch section than I could see that people were starting to ask to come onto my watch team. And there was a sort of excitement and energized culture that was built around this and but then but then the, but then I went to my next job and the, and the window shut and, and I was back to just doing what I was told and trying to tell other people what to do I I hated telling people what to do I, I didn't like managing people I thought it was a giant pain in the ass and I, it was a big waste of time and I was like why and I would talk to my officers and say do you need me to manage you and they would all say no I said well why are we doing all this and we had all these we had all these artifacts, we had all these meetings, we had all these reports, we had all, we, we had this whole industry that was based on managing the people below you and right. reporting up. It's managing down, reporting up. And I said, you know, let's, we're going to flip that. You guys tell me, you report up and tell me what you're going to, what you intend to do. And I'll manage my boss. I'll spend that time managing my boss. And because I cleared my mind of all this clutter. Now, some people do need a little bit of external they, they 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 need to be told what to do i guess i i think just from conditioning not from human nature so basically what happens is you lean back as a leader don't lean in that's terrible advice lean back and then see the team that leans into you four or five four out of five of your people are going to lean into you that's great you want them keep them this is the fifth person Either find a job for them or they can just do what they're told or they'll self-select out of the program. But if you could like wave a wand and say, well, who on my team is only doing what they're doing because I'm making them do it and versus who on my team is really motivated and they, they're they committed to our mission and, and they're self-driving and, and you could just sort of paint pixie dust and have it sort of show up. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, that's what happens is because like, if I just stop telling people what to do, the people say, oh, they're great. There's an opportunity not to do anything. Great. Now you know. Get rid of them or find, find you know, don't promote them. Don't recommend them for promotion. So us telling people what to do masks the, the truly energetic, self-starting, proactive people. Right. Well, so you, you had a, it sounds like you had some of your own instincts, your own like this doesn't make sense to me. You had some mentor, someone that talked to you about your intentions, and you 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 had some some success with it. So you you were in such a difficult position here. Is that what you said? This is my only option is to go because you couldn't manage it. You know, you couldn't tell me you weren't the expert of the ship. So was yeah. it some of it was like necessary? you know, necessities of mother invention type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And Einstein's got a quote where he says something like, if I had 24 hours to work on a problem, I'd, I'd spend 23 hours formulating right. this problem and then one hour on the solution, something like right. that. Right. And so the pro when, when when you're in a culture where your job is to give orders, and get people to do it. And then, and you, you do basically know, I mean, I would basically know most of what I needed the team to do because I was a smart guy. I was a math team guy. I would study really hard and I generally would know the answer. So then when you make a mistake, the problem is you made a mistake here because basically everything I said would have been a mistake. The problem, I had to reframe the problem. The problem was not I made a bad decision. The problem was I was the person making decisions. And I saw how all my tools for leadership, it was, it was like this, someone just took a hammer and smashed me on the side of the head. It was like I was seeing stars because I was, could see all my tools were based, like if you had made an industrial, a picture of an industrial age factory with a foreman and a bunch of people on an assembly line, that's yep. a, that, and you just laid that on top of the submarine or whatever company you want, Boeing, Twitter, whatever company you want to put on. That's what the language is designed for. 
And that's what we teach people. And we think we're really good. And then we really pat ourselves on the back because we say, oh, you know, I'm allowing you. Because we used to not allow them, them, the working people, the doing people to actually have any thought process. But I say, oh, well, you can choose how. Aren't we so enlightened and generous? And it's such crap because what we really need is to get everybody involved in what like what are we going to do because once the team decides what we're going to do they're in it they own it and so i always had to be i i viewed myself as the goalie and the ball was a decision the ball would become bouncing down the field driven by the other team and i always wanted someone on my team to pick it up turn around and run it push it the other direction but if it got by all the defenders i was still the goalie and i would catch the ball and prevent it from going in the goal But I knew if I was the guy catching the ball, if I was the one making the decision, in other words, there was no one behind me. And as much as I wanted and much as I would convince myself, oh, my team will speak up. They'll tell me if I'm wrong. I knew the odds were always against it. And this Mm -hmm. is what these these leaders get wrong. They think just by sitting there and saying, oh, well, you, you have the power to speak up. And then every once in a while in a meeting, once every six months, someone does and say, I think you're wrong. They go, oh, look, all the evidence is on one side. They're all telling me. But there's no evidence. We don't put a chalk mark. You know, I, What I want is give people a chalk mark, say, put a mark by the door, conference room door, every time you didn't speak up when you thought things were messed yeah, it'd up. Yeah, it would be a thousand to one, right? Yeah, it would be a thousand to one. And But we never see that. So we're convinced the one is the data, not the thousand. So we need to... Stop telling people what to do and see what they think. Now, it's always within bounds. And there were things that orders that I did give in terms of structuring the language. And eventually, sometimes I would have to make a decision when it was at my level. But in general, my objective was not to make decisions and get the team to tell me what they intended to do without contamination from what I thought. So let's just talk about that for a second. Then I want to get into some of the like practical methods and tactics you used but on this topic there clearly is like different stratums of decisions right i mean if somebody gives you an assignment you know the president of the united states says we're going to go to this theater and have more support or we're going to do go do this operation like that that's a directive that's not for the people on the ship to debate it's not for you to even debate it's an order that's kind of the highest level and then from there, there's like multiple, multiple different levels, you know, that have to do with strategy and go to market, you know, for companies. In your case, it's, you know, it's military strategy, it's training, what have you. But at right. some level, you say, hey, I'm not going to tell you how to, you know, tune the engine or how to run this protocol. I mean, you, you guys are more educated, more knowledgeable. So how do you distinguish those different levels to engage, you know, the people at, differently because you can't you can't have one size fits all right so yeah i mean that's true we're all we're all operating within a a system where we have bounded decision making and you need to know what the bounds are and this is when you go to your boss and say hey you know you you if you work at tesla you it's going to be something to do with cars and batteries and autonomous driving vehicles or something you're not going to go say oh hey i want to start a a luxury resort in Bahamas. It's not like that's not what we do here. So so everyone's bounded, the leaders bounded by one, the values and the ethics and the morals of the organization, just like everybody else is. They don't get an exemption. And so what we yeah, I guess I, I, I agree with exactly what, what you're saying. But if you can get the team to elevate their thinking. I think this this issue of like, a decision is not a binary thing. It's not like I decide or you decide, and not all decisions are the same. I think that's where you can make some money. So I, I at the top, you have why and what decisions, like what should we do and why are we doing it? And then sort of lower are how decisions. And uh, this is, there's science behind this. And, and it tends, decisions that are in, uh, further away in our mind, either spatially or temporally, are, can be interpreted at a higher level. So even something as simple, what we all know from time. So if I say, hey, in a, in a year, there's a conference in Singapore and it looks really interesting. So I'm like, well, why am I going there? Oh, because it looks really interesting. Well, what am I going to do? I choose to go to the conference. But then as we get close, now my thinking kind of goes down. It's like, well, how do I get there? I need 
airplane, hotel, blah, blah, blah. And then the problems with how kind of rise up. This is why you always have fewer people showing up at an event than sign up. It's never the other way around because as you get closer, it's those concrete things that rise up, which when we're far, far away, we don't really worry or think about, oh yeah, it's 12, 12 time zones away, but yeah, that's it's just, it's an abstract thing. And then when I get closer, so when you invite the team higher, you can use some tricks like, well, first of all, have them not be them. So you say, well, what would I do? Or what would the boss do? Or what would the board want us to do? Or what would our replacements want us to do? So that's number one. Number two is, you could say something like, imagine there's a team on the other side of the planet and they're dealing, they have the same problem. What do you, what would you want them to do? Again, it strips away all the concrete detail that's probably not that important. And then finally, you can advance it in time. So you say, imagine you're inhabiting your, your future self. So you're now 20 years older and you're looking back to today or six months. Six months is what I would use for myself. It's six months in the future, and I think back to today, and what I'll say, what, did, what would Commander Marquet from six months from now want Commander Marquet to do today? And what that does is, that, again, it demotivates the, oh, I just got to get through this today, because then six months, obviously, I'm going to have the same problem. I got to solve the same thing versus I'm going to invest in thinking and getting my team thinking, building a thinking factory, getting building a decision-making factory where with output is quality decisions and and it kind of shifts you more for the long term so these are good mental vehicles for getting out of the here and now and actually making better decisions and so when you do is you get the team up to that level uh not not for a long time it could be five minutes it could be for half a day whatever you get the team up to that level and then you just the team decides what and then you launch into the how you launch into the doing of the thing. And when you're in the doing of the thing, you cannot worry that it's a good decision. Just be 100% in the doing, knowing that two weeks from now or whatever, we're going to put a pause. We're going to elevate ourselves again. We're going to look left. We're, look, we're going to look right. And we're going to adjust and go into again. So it allows you, A, to make better, broader decisions, but it also allows you to be more focused and into the work when you're into the work. So the work's better and the decision's better. So it's not, I mean... What what I hear you saying is not just lip service saying, oh, we'll let you decide some things. We'll take care of the hard stuff. It's really just incorporating people into a, a fuller process, fuller input. It doesn't mean that what they come up with, with the why and the what is going to be what's decided, but they certainly have a say. They certainly can voice uh, and it's encouraged. And it's not just lip service, but it's an authentic like encouragement of we want your thinking. We want your questions. We want your ideas. Yeah. And then we get to, okay, how are we going to do this? Let's go, right? Is that fair? Yeah, and, and it, so for most people, like as a captain, I was the final line of defense. So I try to avoid all decisions. For everybody else in the middle, they're, you're going to have to make decisions. because, But you make decisions with the input of your team, as opposed to I make decisions thinking that I have the input of my team. For example, if I go in and say, hey, we got to catch up with Airbus. We have this new thing. It's been approved by the FAA. It's called 737 MAX. What do you guys think? Well, of course, they're going to all say yes. Yeah, we got to push it to market. So the problem is, so then we convince ourselves, oh, the team had a chance to vote and they're all behind it. Which, which, but by the, by the structure of the conversation, we simply made it very hard for people to disagree with us and then we didn't get any disagreement. So it's just a lot, there's a lot of dishonesty that's, that's happening. And even, even when we say we want we want people to tell us we're wrong. Our language programming still has us run the meeting in a way which makes that difficult because we'll still, we do what we call talk first, then then vote. So we'll still discuss it, which means people are sort of, they can suss out where everyone's position is and then we vote and it tends to be binary. What you want to do is the opposite. You need to vote first, which allows, so the the person with who's an extreme position one way or the other, can vote, they're not going to get contaminated and like either shut down the vote or modify it towards the mean or the group middle, which we know happens. Yeah. And and then and then the decision maker is going to have to make a decision. Individuals make decisions, not teams. We don't let the team think, oh, by the way, you're voting on the decision. 
you're voting to expose what you're thinking is, and that's going to be factored in by the decision maker. Because if you say, oh, I got to make everybody happy, you're never going to make a decision. You're never going to make everybody happy. I so think I got that's the key. I think that's yeah. absolutely a key because it 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 sounds like, and I think this is a big fear of a lot of executives, is that, okay, it sounds great to say I'm going to be a servant leader and I'm going to empower people, but that evolves into, in some companies, like this consensus thinking or this anti-pattern that we all have to sort of get along and make a decision. And that could lead to some really bad decisions, but... I liked how you said that it's being very, very clear that it is the group is not making the decision. They are you are providing your best thinking, your challenging, your insights, your questions, concerns, ideas, yeah. but somebody has to be ultimately accountable for certain levels of decisions, right? But clear accountability. You can't have empowerment without clear accountability and clear ownership. No. So no. so we say individuals make decisions, not teams. And sometimes people are like, whoa, 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 what? And and they're like, didn't I just read this whole book about? Yeah. So I was getting the engineer, the weapons officer, the operations officer to come to me with what they intended to do. Then I would rely on them to speak with their teams in a way that allowed their teams to really say what they thought, not contaminated by what they thought the right quote, right answer was. And so... That's the that's the key. I mean, like, so you ask quite like, well, why didn't why you know why did Musk and Tesla create the first really viable, not ugly electric vehicle? Why didn't General Motors do it? They had more resources. They're building cars. They, they it would have been so much easier. Why? Because they had too many stakeholders. They didn't have anyone being bold. Musk was only accountable to. Them. And then you know if you want if you want to be on my journey with me, join my team. So now there are limits to that, because if you're wrong, like from a society, it's great. I'd love to have 100 of Elon Musk doing 100 different things. If 85 of them don't pan out, what do I care? We still are benefiting right. from the 15 to do. So right. from a society point of view, that's great. But from a, long, from, from a longevity, a 100-year basis point of view is not good, because eventually things change and the leader's wrong, and then the whole organization goes down the tube. So you see like General Electric basically being celebrated and then collapsing as a result of Jack Welsh's decision making. Right. Yeah, it's a great example. So let's shift gears here a little bit. I just got your leadership nudge newsletter and it was, you were in Strasbourg, Germany, and you were talking about, and you have a book about this, but you were talking yeah. about creating a unique language to drive culture change. And I, I travel a lot as well. And it's, I'm just so keenly aware of culture wherever I go. And sometimes it's not just country culture, but subcultures. Like for example, if you go to Venice, you know, it's very clear that they are Venetians first and they are Italian second and they're whatever else, you know, third right. or fourth. So they've got this culture that goes way back before they were ever part of Italy and they've kept that culture. And so you, you talk a lot about language driving that. So maybe just talk a little bit about what, you know, some examples of how language drives you to command and control culture versus, you know, an empowerment culture or what have you. Yeah, I mean, well, Italy is a pretty new invention. There was no Italy before about 1860, and it got unified. And I was in I was in Barcelona, and I apologize for not being able to speak Spanish. I said, "Well, so I said, I said, I'm sorry, I don't speak Spanish." And they said, "Don't worry, we don't either." <laughs> <laughs> right? Because they speak Catalan there. Yep. And yep. they're and they're very proud of it. So, the key is to me that the language drives the culture. Now there may be some at some level over thousand year histories, culture drives the language. And so I think maybe the, the, the environment of the industrial revolution has created a language which is fundamentally coercive because one group gets another group to do it. Well, so, so I'll sit in meetings and I'll get so right, so blah 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 right, so blah 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 right, and then right and blah 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 right and blah blah blah. Why 
why does this person feel like they need to say right every 10 words or after they make a decision? And I'll ask them, say, are you trying to get real reactions to what you're saying? Or do you just want me to nod my head in agreement? They go, oh, no, 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 I really want to know what you think. We'll say, well, you saying right is a vehicle. It's a mechanism for just mindless head, right? We good? Everyone happy? I hear it all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, yes, boss. Drool's coming out the side of my mouth because it's just (laughs) mindless head nodding. And the problem isn't that that's what we really want to be. The problem is we actually do want people to speak up, but we're programmed by this language where this mindless stuff comes out that makes it harder because it's a coercive, fundamentally structurally coercive language. And there's so much baked into the language in terms of number one problem in my mind is this idea that we have two casts. We have the thinkers and the doers. We have the leaders and the followers. We have uh, management and union. And as soon as you start using these words, you're separating people into cast, thinking cast, doing cast. And so these we all have roles and we and we go and we wear different uniforms, we wear different hard colored hard hats. Some companies figured this out. You go to Nucor Steel Company and around 40 years ago, they had a very, particularly enlightened leader who put put them on the map and he changed it. So everyone wears the same hard hat. And then they then they changed it. And they made hard hats like by role. So the safety people would have a different color hard hat. But a lot of construction companies I go to, it's like white for management and blue okay. for workers. There's like white collar, blue collar mirrors. And, and it's like, why are you doing that? You're just telling these people, oh, you're not in the thinking class. You're not in the decision making class. We are. Yep. And so there's this caste system. So we, we go to we go to Silicon Valley and we have an all hands meeting. Why? Hands, really? That's not what your company's like wealth is being built based on people's handwork. So that following the clock, we have a whole culture of of we pay people by the hour, we feel the stress of the ticking clock, and, and we have language that again mirrors this. And again, it's from the production lines of the of the Industrial Revolution, where it was X units per per hour per minute. And that's how you measured production when you were manu- in manufacturing. And it's still how it's that's the appropriate way to do it. But when it comes to decisions, the quality is really much different. The Industrial Revolution was about manufacturing, which benefits from from reducing variability consistent like the first assembly line we all know from school happens by making the same part as similar as possible over and over and over again but then we basically take that mold and put it on the people and so that's what we want and now when we say oh thinking we understand thinking benefits from variability and diversity yes but the language we're using is a reduced variability language so when I say right at the end of the meeting, it's a reduced variability tactic. When I say, hey, what do you guys think about this 737 MAX? And there's a discussion followed by, okay, now let's all vote. Are we gonna launch it or not? Again, it's a reduced variability structure because the conversation, if I vote, if I were to vote twice and people say, well, how strongly do you feel it's ready? It has, it has to be a non-binary vote. That's the first thing. So how ready is it for launch? Whatever the product is. And then we we vote. And sometimes we just do, we hand fit to five. Sometimes you do ones and one, one to 99 voting. But in any event, you're going to get more variability than if you talk about it and then say, okay, now let's vote. You're going to get a lot less variability because people are coalescing their self they're self-censoring their extreme ideas. And those are the things that make the magic. So IDEO, the famous design firm out in Silicon Valley, when they want, when they, when they really want lots of great ideas, they they constrain three or four vectors, and but they leave the one vector unconstrained. So one team, for example, isn't worried about cost, or one team's not worried, is, is only worried about safety and not worried about any of the other things, cost, manufacturability, or anything like that. So it's it, so now I can really 
be extreme. And it's in that integration of those extremes. None of those things we're going to build, but it's an understanding. Well, what is the real boundary here? Because yeah. I'm like my I think the boundary is here, but the boundary is really like way right. out here. This is what right. Musk figured out when it came to the electric vehicles. So that's what you want to would you that's say you that, do. would you say that if you were really want to drive culture change that one you need to have really clear intent and two what you were just talking about is you need to change your language to be more inclusive more engaged more authentic to drive that some of that conversation with those the two things or what else would you add to that well yeah intent means like you need to know Here's the activity we do with leaders of companies that one of the activities that we do. We'll say, hey, we'll say, hey, I want to fill in the following blank. We would like a culture that is more blank. What do they put in? We we know all the words. Collaborative, thinking, right. engaged, ownership, yep. inclusive, whatever. So I say, okay, great. Now pick one. So as a team, they got to pick one. And they say, now write a script. I want you to write a script for the office. Uh, like you're like you're videotaping a scene from yep. the office and yep. so you have but you i want a small group five people sitting around a table discussing an issue or making a decision and i want you to put the words in these people's mouths so that anyone watching this little clip is going to say oh my gosh that team's the most blank inclusive collaborative whatever yep. engaged team i've ever seen why does this work? Number one is because, first of all, when we use a word, any of those words, we, the only thing I can guarantee is what you're thinking, what I'm thinking are not, not right. exactly the same. They, exactly. they may be similar, but they're not going to be the same. So when I say, well, what does it mean to be, quote, inclusive? I got to put pe words in people's mouths. Now all that friction is going to come out. Well, no, that's not what we, that's not what I mean. I mean, okay, great. So that comes out. Number two is then you end up with a script that you can then practice. It's the practicing of the script. I'll give you an example. On the submarine, I got upset one day because people were referring they. They were saying they did this, they did that. And they were talking to people in the submarine, and we're only 145 people, and it's you know we all live within 200 feet of each other. So the fact that some people for six months, I mean, we go away and we're there for six months. So the fact that we could refer to each other as they, which of course means not in my tribe, not to be trusted, not to be collaborated with, was mind blowing. Of course I knew it, but it wasn't, it just struck me one day, the, the number of times I heard it. They officers enlisted, they engineering ops, you know, whatever, they're all these micro tribes. And so we outlawed the word and we had to start using the word we, and so I did give an order. I said, that word is outlawed. You can use they for the Pentagon and for Naval Headquarters. That was always a lot of fun. Say, well, they made us do this. But on, on the submarine, it's going to be we. Right. And it we was the repeated use of done. we, yep. which caused our brains to, re, to grow the connections that made it feel like. So I say, oh, Craig, instead of saying, well, you, you're on the marketing team, they're on marketing, and we're over here on production. It was like we are on, we are in the bigger circle. We're in the company, whatever. And then the feeling happens. So the action comes first, and it drives the mind, the feeling, the mindset, not the other way around. And there's a lot of people making a lot of money trying to change people's mindset, but it's going to be endless work because it's not the way. Nothing will happen. It's interesting what you just described is. The same technique that, you know, the Miracle on Ice movie, the 1980 Miracle on Ice, and famously the coach, you know, there was all these superstar kids from all these different colleges, University of Minnesota, Boston, and he found, you know, that they were having their little tribes, you know, here's three or four guys from Boston, here's three or four from Newton, and they were, and he basically called out language and saying, you know, who are you playing for the front of your Jersey or the back of your Jersey. And so right. he, he had to call that out and they had to say they're playing for the front of the Jersey USA, not the back of their Jersey, whatever school or their last name or whatever. And it's interesting because he, that was a very important move, you know, point in the movie where you, we were either going to be a team and be all in together, or we're just going to be a bunch of individuals. Now, maybe that was overplayed. Maybe it was over dramatized. I don't know, but 
to drive the change of that team culture, it was about the language that they were using. And, and you know, that, it's just an interesting correlation. So there must be something to that. There uh, is something to I mean, I, I love that. Herb Brown goes in and he Herb Brooks, sort of yeah. unexpectedly turns the thing around. I remember I was at the Naval Academy then. And yeah. like the U.S. was we were not in a good place. It just no. seemed like we were getting our butts kicked left, right and everywhere. We had inflation, all these other problems. And then that thing happened. I remember like we were we were watching the whole like the whole building, which is like this building housing 4000 students was just erupting. It was crazy. And so you but you see that. You, you see, I sat next to an NFL head coach on a flight, and he had his playbooks. Uh, he sat down in the air, sat down next to me, and he had this big duffel bag with like these three big three, three yep. inch three binders, yep. and he pulled them out. And I said, I don't know who the guy was, but t- it turns out he's kind of famous coach. And I started talking to him, and I was like, Well, can like I'm I'm a leadership guy. I'm not trying to steal your plays, but like, can you like, what's it like? Show me like, what what does it look like? Yeah. And so I expected to see like little, you know, how little arrows and like, you know, block uh, yeah. this guy and that kind yeah. of thing. And he flips it open, and the whole first binder is it, it, just words. And I said, "What's all this about?" I says, "It's all about language." I said, "We got it. We so we we designed the language that the team's going to use, not." not just on the field, in the locker room, at practice, when they're at home. And and we start with, it's, he, I didn't set, I didn't, I didn't prime it. He's just like That's voluntarily said, it's yeah. all about language. Lang- I've and never, the football never comes later. That language and culture were so directly related in terms of like influencing one another. But it, I mean, it makes 100, I mean, I've been, I played football and college and it wasn't we had our team again it's all about teams right we had a language and only the people on the team would know the language anyone else right. wouldn't understand this language it, you know and even in world war ii hitler he was consolidating the german language there was something like 80 dialects of german pre World War II pre Hitler, and he basically said, "No, there's one version of the German language. That's a way of coercion. That's a way of influencing. That's a way of getting control of the people." So it's interesting how it's like you see it in every aspect of life, really. Yeah. So let me exactly. let me shift gears here. So what I want to just really briefly talk about this little space that's. You know, we're, we're very involved with this. So we do a lot of work in management consulting, helping organizations change. One of the areas is this notion of business agility, which started from agile in the software development world. And now it's kind of spread organizationally wide. It's interesting when you talk about language, like Spotify famously created an entire new language around this agility. And everyone wanted to copy them. And they said, don't copy us. We built it for ourselves. We didn't build it for anyone else. But everyone wanted to copy the Spotify model because they created such a unique language about how they work together. So anyways, one of the things that I see very often work with leadership teams is this isn't just for, you know, do like you said, the doers, you guys go do this agile stuff and we'll get better results. But we're not going to change. Like there's a direct conflict there. So right. we would, we sit down with leadership teams and say, listen, this is about how you lead as much as it's about how they're doing the work and and you have to um, really shift to more servant leadership empowerment etc and they kind of listen and nod head and they say no this is like it's very serious like this will not work if if you don't have alignment and so one of the ways we do to break that ice is we show your video your your famous that you know one the one viral instructional video about just you know the intent-based leadership on the submarine it's a wonderful video it only takes about 10 minutes to watch and then we get a discussion afterwards and it's interesting because when we first bring up this topic about you know the kind of leadership that you're going to employ is going to really dictate how people engage or don't engage or you know believe you and change really and we get a lot of resistance when we say well what about you can you change to the same values and principles that you're asking the people to live by can you live by those and we get a lot of resistance we get a lot of defensiveness wow that doesn't work for us we're too you know someone has to make the big decisions and they don't understand this and they don't understand that and then we show the video and say okay now let's discuss after you see like you know one of the most intense places on earth a nuclear class submarine right 
big yeah. decisions, big ramifications. Can these kinds of techniques be deployed? And we do see like people go, wow, if, if it can be done there, why can't maybe I rethink? But my question for you is why is it so hard for, I mean, in, on some level, kind of get the industrial age, how companies were built. And some of that came from military. We went through two world wars. We trained a lot of people and they went back and built the industry. But to another degree, it's some of this is very like, not obvious, but it's very logical. If you want to get the most out of your people, your biggest asset, you you want to engage them. You want to use their brains, not just have them follow you. Like that's very logical. It's a very sort of fast changing world where resources can go anywhere, especially kind of in the US, Western world, like they can get a job wherever they want to get a job. And then, you know, it's it's almost obvious, like this is a way you have to go if you want to compete in this digital world and compete for the best, smartest people, right? So why is it so hard for leaders to change and not like just, this is just an obvious path for us to go down and we can't compete in this old mindset? Yeah, their brains are tricking them into thinking it's better to be in control than to give control to the team. They think that that's more resilient because they're the ones making decisions, which is they're simply their brain searching for certainty and over-biasing them in, in the wrong direction. You're more resilient. So I got two stories. One is, so I was doing a speech in, in the Netherlands several years ago, and there was a guy in the audience who was borderline disruptive, but he, I, I think he really took issue with the fact that I was in the military and he was kind of like, well, he was asking questions like, well, you know, if you got an order to shoot a missile or nuclear missile, I mean, would you just do it? And I said, look, here's a question. It, who, would, who do you want running nuclear submarines? People who are just going to blindly follow orders or people who are actually thinking, not just the captain, but like at every level. Anyway, I got to kind of quiet down. But I had, so I was doing a seminar the other day. And one of the things we really like to do is to get people to, to we, we say we act our way to new thinking. So this is, again, we use words, but we also use practice. Like I can explain soccer pretty easily, kick the ball in the net. That doesn't mean you're going to be any good. So say we got to act our way to new thinking. So I said, okay, so we're about to go on lunch break. When you're on lunch break, here's what I invite you to do. Pair up and have the other person get your lunch. It was like a lunch being served inside yep. the yep. conference room. So, I mean, the risk here was basically zero because it, the, the selection was already made by the people who ordered like the food. Right. I mean, there were like two or three different choices, maybe chicken or fish. I don't even remember. Anyway, so I said, hey, pair up because I want you to practice. I want you to know what it feels like to give up control. And in this case, we're going to give up. They're not going to say what they intend to do. They're just going to go do it. So we're actually going to push it a little further than we normally like, but just for purposes of the exercise. So 30 people get up, they go, you know how many people did it? Zero. And I, and I was asking, I, I didn't want to like poke them in the eye too much, but I was like, well, how, like, so let's talk about this. Why did no one right. do it? And they had a, what? Oh, well, I know. I knew what would have happened. <laughs> oh, I have, I'm really picky eater. Well, that's part of the deal. You know, right. how are you going to see, you know, see, I'm using my own, I'm using industrialized language. So anyway, they had all these reasons. I mean, I, I was a little disappointed because they, they weren't really fully in. They were sort of phoning it in at that point in my mind. But Sometimes, you know, I do the same thing when I'm reading a book and it says, okay, now write some, take out a piece of paper, write some notes, close your eyes, imagine this. Do I do that? Probably not. I'm just, a, I'm just going to sort of imagine what it would be like imagining kind of a thing. But these are actual physical things that we ask people to do. Go to dinner, don't order, get the server to choose for you, or get one of your, someone else to choose for you. You got to know what it feels like, not imagine. Sometimes imagining works, but for this, no. Like, so do oh. you think deep down, is it the, 
the neural pathways in our brain are just so entrenched in doing the same thing over and over. We have to like literally bounce ourselves out to do something that we haven't done before. This is your, you know, you got to act, you got to practice, you got to envision it. Is it, is it that that's the big thing or is it that people just don't want to fail? Or something? all that. I, yeah. I, I tried myself. I, I just say DSD, do something different. Yeah. Um, that's, yeah, do, you do something different. So if I drive to the swimming pool one way every day, every once in a while I'll say, oh, I'm just going to do something different. I'll pick like the alternate route. Is that life changing? Probably not. But sometimes say I go on a run. I tend to be a guy when I go on my runs, I have it all planned out how fast I'm going to go. I'm going to go the left, right, left, right on these trails, parks and with a bunch of trails near where I live here, which is very nice. And I have the whole thing planned out. Right. And then one day, like part of it's flooded. And if it's all overly rigidly planned out in my mind and I'm making a left and I've gone half a mile down the trail and then it's flooded, and I got to go back in my head. I'm like, oh man, I'm dry. you know, I jogged an extra half a mile or a mile, and now I got to figure. I, I guess all like I'm, I'm, I'm trashed. I'm useless. Versus every once in a while, I say, I'm just going to go. I won't even wear my watch. I'm just going to go run around and just enjoy it for 90 minutes or so until I get tired or whatever, and I come back and. You know, I don't know, maybe do one, I mean, maybe that's 10% of them I do like that. Or especially if I don't know where I'm at, I'll try, like, I'm going to run out and run back. I'm not going to look at the wall. I'm not going to look at my map. See if I can get home without looking at the map. And then you end up half a mile away. And then you say, okay, now I'm, I'm lost. And then you, I'm half a mile. Oh, my gosh, I went an extra. So I think you have to practice dealing. It, you find ways in your personal life to practice dealing with these I don't know what you call them, but like uncertainty and changes. Yeah. And just being able to adapt to it and just say, okay, just turn around and run the other way. And like, it's fine. What's the big deal? Like, I'm the like 257th millionth fastest person in the United States. <laughs> what difference right. does that make? <laughs> no, I think, and I think that's why your story, I mean, I think, I think it is the neural pathways. And I think, that we do get just in ruts, you know, and our brain does that for efficiency. But, you know, I think the higher you go up in organizations, I think they're more, you know, they've built up all of this muscle memory of what's worked for them and what hasn't worked for them. You know, sometimes we say like the more you have invested in something, the harder it is to change. Right. And so if you're a leader, you got 30 years in, you know, it's like, I'm not going to change. This is what got me to be successful. This is what, who right. I am, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, I think that is a big challenge, but I think that the world is changing very fastly, you know, quickly in a lot of different ways. And people are, you know, having to be forced to kind of rethink and why wouldn't you be open to considering better ways? And I think your story does a wonderful job of saying, hey, if if you can do it in this environment, why can't I do it running some company making some widgets? You know, like get let's get over our own ego and our own self and say, hey, maybe there I can consider other things. So let me ask you this. You've been in this business of post military for, you know, 15 plus or minus years here doing leadership. You do a lot of consulting. Obviously, you've got books that you're, you've written. So you're working with a lot of companies and you're seeing what the corporate world is like and, you know, the challenges are different. Some may be the same, but are you seeing, you know, society or corporate America shifting? Are we getting better? Are we getting moving on this or and what do you see as the future what are the trends <laughs> yeah so recognize it's totally self-selecting i mean a company's not going to hire me yeah if they don't already think that this is how they the, the direction they need to go and we we always say we never convince anyone to do this but if if you think this is the way you want to go then we think we can help because we have a lot of experience now and we get a pretty constant stream of companies who want to change i think the trend is here's my grand theory of what's happening in the world right now yeah which is 
if you think about the doing work and the thinking work, the doing work is moving towards extinction because uh, bots, robots, AI. algorithms, and AI is is taking it over more and more. They're taking big, big chunks of, of that stuff. And the people doing the doing work sense this. They, 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 they see it. They, they, they are, aren't able to, their bargaining power is getting reduced. They're being replaced. They're being downsized. They're being replaced by robot, on, on, whatever. They sense it. They know it's happening. And so the value of that kind of work is heading towards zero. And there's only going to be thinking work because machines are going to do this. And then, so, so they're acting up because they don't like it because they, they think they made this deal and the deal is being reneged on, which I think they're partly right. And so whether you're on the extreme left or the extreme right, basically it's being driven by the same thing. It's this fear of, of irrelevance and, and, and not mattering. And so what we need to do in business is we need to get everybody involved in thinking. If you're part of the thinking class, which everyone should be, because we like to think as human beings, we like to solve problems, then you're probably a lot more secure. I, I, I try to really appreciate like the fear behind the way some people protect their jobs. And I like, why is this guy so afraid? And then, because for me, I was like, well, you know, if this doesn't work out, I'll do something else. I mean, because I always know I have my brain with me and I can right. figure things right. out. I don't think we really appreciate someone who's been conditioned. Like all you do is weld. And it's like, oh, well, go learn AI. Well, a welder's not going to learn how to no. code an AI. Right. This is not going to happen. So, and then we blame them. Well, you know, you could have gone to a job, you know, re retraining program, but you didn't. So... So I think we need to really be careful and we really owe it to all of humanity because we need everyone thinking, not just, oh, yeah. some anointed, whatever, gurus. That's terrible. That'd be terrible. We need every all of humanity thinking. Or rely on AI, that. right? AI is going to do our thinking. That, what, that doesn't sound like a great future either. Well, you know, one of my experience with AI is, and I love it and I use it a lot, is uh, it's pretty good. It's it's okay at the how. Like if I say write an email or you know do write an 800, uh, 800 word synopsis of this book, it can do that pretty well. But to say to me, hey, this morning I think what you really need to be doing is focus on this, this, this. Like it's not so good at, to me at the what or the why, but it's pretty good at the how. Now maybe eventually, hundred years from now, it'll, it'll move up, up market. But yeah, so that's my uh, prognostication for whatever right. it's, it's worth. Well, very go. Well, we could talk forever on this topic. It's certainly been in, interesting and enlightening, but we always finish every podcast with the, the, the same question, which is just putting aside all this leadership discussion in your books. If you just look back on your whole career, you're sitting down with yourself when you were 18 or maybe your grandkids, you just want to you know, give some piece of advice just about the life experience, what you've learned in life. What would some of that advice be? I'd say the number one thing is seek feedback whenever possible. And, and so this probably applies all the way along. So when you're just starting out, I was alert. I, I didn't like feedback. Like it was like in, in the Navy, we kind of had this sort of structured thing for feedback, which makes it kind of unpleasant. And uh, I would have spent much more time Hey, how to how to how to show up? How do I lead that meeting? How well do you think I listen to you? Actually, the more specific, the the better. And then, just get into this habit of always seeking feedback, because no one cares about feedback if they're not seeking it. So, you, if you tell me after this podcast, hey, that was pretty good, except for this one point, Bob. Like, you know what, Craig? I really don't care. Like, I'll try, I'll pretend. I'll put like. A good face on. Oh, thank you so much. I'll incorporate that next time. And that's not what I'm thinking in my head. I'm like, F this guy. So, but if I'm like, hey, I really do am uh, driven by improvement and by and winning in the long run, it, it, I really need to know how, you know, how to do it, how this shirt look, how, how was the light, whatever. Right. Then you're seeking feedback. Now it doesn't hurt. There's no sting because they're just, they're helping you. And so, and I think this is the one piece of advice that kind of applies no matter when and where, where you are. That feedback is always, it's weird because I do swimming and 
I videotape myself and I send my videotapes into my coach who's in Australia. And like the worst thing you could possibly say would be, oh, your stroke's perfect. There's nothing we can do with it because right. that means I can't get any faster. I'm screwed. Like the only way to get faster is to get younger now. <laughs> right. So, so I want, like, I want him to say, you know, the way your right hand's entering, it's a little bit twisted and it's coming over. You know, so you, you want to get it in line with your shoulder. And, and so let's do this drill. Like, I want that. But with, when it comes to leadership and communication, for some reason, it's like, uh, you know, I hope no one, you know, has a problem with this. So yeah. we seek, seek feedback's my one thing. That's take a, that, that's a take great, that to the bank. Yeah, it's very applicable at every part of life. And it, I always say there's I always say there's one thing that creates improvement and that's failure. You don't you don't get better generally by having all these successes. You get better by failing, learning from it, retrospecting, what can I do better? How's my stroke? But I I guess we could add this to it, feedback, like in like seeking feedback and learning from failure, that's what creates improvement. So I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, thanks again. Appreciate all your time and sharing your uh, life story with us. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks to the listeners. Mm -hmm.